Welcome, everybody. My name is Winnie Armand, and I am an Associate Director at Mass General Center for the Environment and Health. We're really eager to have you here with us today to, to listen to our uh, esteemed speaker, Dr. Parlberg. Um, this is a collaboration between our center as well as the MGH Institute for Health Professions, Center for Climate Change, Climate Justice and Health, as well as the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, please do feel free to put questions throughout this talk into the Q&A, and there will be time at the end of the hour to, to have a discussion. I also note that this will be recorded, and you will receive an email in a few days with a link to this recording. So today, I am really pleased to present to you Dr. Rob Paulberg. Um, he is an associate at Harvard's Weatherhead Center and also an associate in the Sustainability Science Program at Harvard Kennedy School. He had been an adjunct professor of public policy at the Kennedy School and is emeritus, emeritus professor of political science at Wellesley College. He received his PhD in international relations from Harvard University. His specialty is international food and agricultural policy. Dr. Parlberg is the author of many press books, including one on agricultural technology in Africa called Starved for Science, another on America's overconsumption of both food and fuel titled The United States of Excess, and most recently a book titled Resetting the Table, Straight Talk About the Food We Grow and Eat, which was a Novelist Book Award winner in 2022. He's been a member of the Board of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the National Research Council of the National Academies. Um, and he has worked in Africa, South Asia, as a consultant to the International Food Policy Research Institute, USAID, and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the Aspen Institute, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His current research is focused on adaptation to climate change and sea level rise in West Africa. So welcome, Dr. Paulberg. Thanks, Winnie. It's a it's a pleasure to uh, to meet you and to have this chance to speak to to your uh, to your audience about regenerative agriculture, which is a recently popular social movement that uh, is attempting to address uh, soil health and also uh, climate change, both adaptation and mitigation by uh, promoting uh, alternatives to our uh, to our industrial food production system, which as I'm sure you know, has a bad reputation, especially on environmental grounds. Uh, this, this gives me a chance to, to organize some of my own thinking on, uh, on, on regenerative agriculture. I'm, I'm not uh, as enthusiastic as some of the leaders of this movement uh, might be, it's good for it's good for some things. I think it's promise when it comes to climate change uh, adaptation is uh, and 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 mitigation is so far uh, unproven. Uh, now, of course, um, I'll share my screen. There are uh, a number of suggested alternatives to our current farming system in the United States, which is large scale, highly specialized, industrial, highly capitalized. Uh, it has drawn criticism from environmentalists for decades now. And there have been a number of iterations of, uh, of alternative visions. One was back in 1976, the, the, the name sustainable agriculture was was coined by Wes Jackson, a farmer in, in Kansas who still runs a land institute uh, out there. He didn't like monocultures of annual crops. He thought it would be more sustainable to promote polycultures of perennial crops. And he's still doing that, but not too many farmers have found that to be commercially advantageous. So it hasn't gone very far. Now, organic farming, uh, of course, has been around for a hundred years but the United States didn't create a national organic standard until 1990. 
organic farming is farming without any synthetic uh, chemicals. The Organic Food Production Act created this national organic standard. It's interesting that it was motivated uh, not by environmental sustainability concerns, but by pesticide residue concerns. And organic farming really hasn't uh, gone that far either in terms of replacing conventional uh, industrial farming. Less than 1% of harvested crop cropland in the United States is uh, certified for organic production, despite the popularity of organic foods with, uh, with many consumers. A third alternative vision is called agroecology. And this is farming crops with techniques that uh, that imitate nature rather than trying to, to dominate nature, mixing animals and crops and trees uh, in the same field. This is uh, an approach that's been promoted by non-governmental organizations and also by the United Nations uh, in a 2008 International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development Report. But agroecology isn't that popular uh, with farmers because it's so, uh, labor intensive. It's too often uh, like hand gardening, something that uh, that requires too much human labor to get the production that is needed and desired. So now we have a new alternative vision called regenerative uh, agriculture. It's only been heavily promoted for only about a half a dozen years, and yet it is uh, it has taken off uh, in the cultural space. It's definitely uh, uh, trending. If, if you go to uh, Google search or Google trends rather, and, and look up their index numbers for Google searches for the term regenerative agriculture in the month of November for these years back to 2010, you'll see that regenerative agriculture wasn't uh, really on the, uh, it was not on the horizon until after about 2015. Since 2017, it's seen a steady increase in visibility among those in the United States uh, doing uh, Google searches. And by 2022, this is an index number. It's normalized to 100. It's, it's reached its uh, peak in 2022. Now, what, what, is, what is regenerative agriculture? Uh, one problem is there's no... Uh, official definition. There's not even a consensus definition. It's mostly a, a, a grab bag of farming methods that have as their goal, either soil health or specifically the sequestration of carbon underground in the soil to, to mitigate climate change. The, the different Methods for farming that are sometimes included under regenerative agriculture include, um, first of all, four that uh, have been in widespread use for a long time. They're not new at all. Uh, crop rotations, where you you grow corn in a field in one year and then you go soybeans the next year. You don't grow corn and then corn again. You rotate crops. Cover crops, um, also after the harvest in the fall, you plant maybe some ryegrass or some radishes uh, in the field to have a, a green cover on the field during the winter months to protect the soil, to soak up some extra nit nitrogen, maybe to, uh, uh, to help uh, retain soil moisture. Uh, and, then, and then you plant a new crop uh, through the remainder of those cover crops in the spring. That's being done today on about 40% of uh, agricultural land in the United States. Reduced tillage is another regenerative approach. This has been popular in the United States since the 1970s uh, when farmers learned that they could save money if they didn't plow their field every spring, they'd save diesel fuel. This was during the energy crisis of the 1970s. There's now different kinds of reduced tillage. There's no-till, strip-till, uh, ridge-till, <laughs> different techniques that allow farmers to reduce their plowing and plant seeds for the next crop directly through the residue left over from the previous uh, year's harvest. Manuring is another way to uh, improve the soil uh, that's 
uh, favored by those that are interested in regenerative agriculture. It's not new. Back during the 1950s, the 1960s, if you had a, a corn and hog farm in the Midwest, you had to have a manure spreader. That was one way to keep uh, your soil nutrients uh, uh, up to uh, up to snuff. Uh, another technique is is longstanding, uh, integrating crops and livestock, but it's no longer an important part of most commercial farming in the United States, which has become highly specialized. The Regen Ag community wants crops and livestock to, uh, to, to be grown together to close the cycle so that the, the animal waste can fertilize the crops and, and, uh, and, the, the, and the animals can themselves graze on crop residues. It's a, an integration system that used to be commonplace, but it's not so much anymore. Another Regen Ag approach is called rotational or multi-species grazing, holistic grazing. This is a, a livestock production method that doesn't finish beef cattle in feedlots. It keeps them on pasture, but it doesn't turn them loose in the pasture. It brings them in groups from one part of the pasture uh, to the next in sequence in separate sealed off paddocks so that an overgrazed section can have, can have plenty of time for the grass to regrow and in the process uh, sequester carbon uh, underground. Uh, I remind you that uh, uh, sequestering carbon is something that plants do naturally. They take CO2 out of the atmosphere. The, uh, the carbon goes into the plant tissue and through the roots it goes underground. And uh, the, the purpose of regenerative agriculture is to, to turbocharge that process, and then to work as best they can to make sure the carbon stays underground. And that's often tricky because if a field is, is plowed, uh, the carbon that's been sequestered underground can be, uh, can be released. Organic methods are also uh, sometimes considered uh, as a part of the regenerative package. In fact, the very first use of the word regenerative came from Robert Rodale at uh, the Rodale Institute, which promotes organic farming. Uh, he said that the purpose of organic agriculture isn't just to protect the soil, but to, uh, to improve the soil. And he coined the term regenerative organic agriculture. The problem is this is, a, this is a big tent. There are a lot of different methods here in play, and sometimes they don't all go together. Organic methods where you can't use any synthetic chemicals or any uh, GMOs don't always uh, work well with uh, reduced tillage, which is spread rapidly in the United States, uh, because uh, you can use herbicides uh, to, uh, to kill the weeds uh, in the field. Even though the crop is growing, you plant GMO crops that are resistant to the herbicides and the system works uh, uh, very well. So it's hard to mix reduced tillage with organic methods. But the rest of these methods are, are uh, usable in, in different combinations. Now, uh, why has regenerative agriculture been trending? What's the, the reason that it's uh, recently popular? Uh, the main reason is that uh, it's an, uh, an alternative vision of agriculture that addresses the climate crisis directly, both through mitigation and through uh, adaptation. Regen Ag promises that uh, the crops grown will be resilient in the face of, of um, abiotic stress from from climate change, and it also claims to mitigate uh, the climate crisis by sequestering carbon underground. Uh, it's and because it's a big tent, uh, it allows some large commercial farms to imagine that they can participate. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't push different kinds of agriculture away according to some rigid formula. It's a. Uh, it's flexible enough to allow many farm. Um, sectors to imagine participating. Now, uh, another ironic reason why it's trending is that uh, this carbon sequestration that it claims to make possible is hard to measure. Uh, it's uh, soil organic carbon is, is complicated to measure. You have to take soil samples in many different locations and at many different depths, and then you have to send those samples to a lab where, the, where they'll be uh, 
incinerated in order to measure the carbon that's released. This is a, a laborious and uh, expensive process simply to get a baseline. So to measure the carbon that's being added to that baseline is very difficult. It's hard to prove the claims of carbon sequestration. But that means it's also hard to disprove those claims. So advocates for Regen Ag have been able to, to make uh, some uh, very bold claims uh, without anyone yet having been able to, uh, uh, to reject them completely. Probably uh, the most interesting part of regenerative agriculture as a social movement is that uh, it's attractive to farmers. It's a, it's a alternative agriculture approach, attractive to farmers because it promises a new revenue stream through what's called carbon farming. Now the uh, uh, carbon farming is uh, where farmers that adopt regenerative methods can claim and then sell credits for uh, the carbon that they have taken out of the atmosphere and sequestered underground. They can then uh, sell these credits either through a third party broker or directly to, for example, large companies that have made pledges of reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and need to buy offsets in order to fulfill those pledges. So uh, farmers that adopt regen methods can imagine themselves uh, getting a new revenue stream from the carbon credits that they sell, uh, either directly to a uh, a company that needs offsets or, or to a broker. Some of these so-called carbon markets in agriculture are already functioning. Uh, Indigo Ag, a small company here in Boston actually, uh, is buying and selling uh, these uh, carbon credits from, from farmers. But for this to go to scale, it's going to need um, investments of uh, government funding, probably from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. To get the markets moving, you need some large purchases of carbon credits with public funds. And then you need uh, a credible uh, a broker to sell those credits to, to those that are looking for offsets. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture is a logical place to do that. And uh, during the the 2020 presidential campaign, uh, uh, Joe Biden's campaign envisioned creating a, a carbon bank inside the Department of Agriculture, uh, capitalized at roughly a billion dollars in commodity credit corporation funding in order to get uh, these carbon markets going. And in 2020, this idea had uh, surprisingly uh, a broad support. Uh, one of the leading cheerleaders for carbon farming was uh, former Vice President Al Gore. This is a, a picture of him on the farm, the family farm that he runs now in Carthage, Tennessee in 2020. He, he held a large conference uh, on his farm. He called it a climate underground movement that he was launching. He had 300 people there to examine the prospects for regenerative agriculture and for, for, for carbon farming. He was going to, uh, he has black Angus steers and he was going to graze them. Uh, he already does graze them in a holistic rotational way. And he was gonna grow his, uh, his field crops also using uh, the various uh, regen techniques that we mentioned earlier. Uh, this idea was endorsed, as I've said, by uh, uh, not just Al Gore, but other Democrats, including uh, the Biden campaign and Senator Debbie Stabenow, who is the, uh, the Democratic chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. But it wasn't just Democrats. Uh, a number of Fortune 500 companies got on board. They thought this was a good idea. IBM, JP Morgan Chase, Cargill, General Motors, General Mills. Uh, General Motors is on my mind, but I'm thinking about General Mills here. Bayer, uh, Chevrolet, uh, BP and Shell, two oil companies, BP and Shell, were all for, for carbon farming because they wanted to buy offsets so that they could meet their, their greenhouse gas reduction pledges. And of course, um, farmers were on board as well, including not just uh, Democrats who make up most of the farms inside the National Farmers Union, but also Republican farmers in the American Farm Bureau Federation. So it looked like this train was leaving the station. They had broad-based bipartisan support 
uh, when uh, the Biden administration uh, came to town to take over in 2021. But then, uh, but then uh, technical specialists inside the Department of Agriculture and probably lawyers as well looked at this concept of regenerative agriculture and the carbon sequestration claims and uh, decided that well, maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't quite ready for prime time. If you couldn't measure, if you couldn't actually measure the gains in soil organic carbon that these agricultural practices were delivering, it might you might be selling phony greenwashed credits uh, to companies that would be finding a, a low cost way to meet their pledges without actually doing anything to reduce the net greenhouse gas emissions. And you might be providing just another lucrative subsidy to large commercial farmers. And so the, the Biden administration uh, backed off of, um, of carbon farming in 2021, when uh, the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, announced his new policies in June 2021, he didn't mention regenerative agriculture. He didn't mention a carbon bank. Uh, he wanted to spend money. The Democrats always like to spend money, but he picked uh, mostly Democratic constituency groups inside uh, the agricultural world, uh, the food and agricultural world, and targeted his his grants at them, a $300 million organic transition initiative to help organic farmers, $75 million to support urban agriculture, uh, 400 million to support regional food business centers to, to relocalize our food system. Uh, farm to school is popular with Democrats, so 60 million for farm to school purchases and 50 million for senior farmers market nutrition programs. So uh, that's what that's what the Vilsack program looked like in 2021. He didn't promise anything separate uh, to use uh, agriculture to sequester carbon. In 2022, 23, he did move into the climate space. He announced a new $3 billion uh, grant program uh, to give to farm groups, universities, and NGOs in order to identify what he called uh, ambiguously, climate smart farming practices. Did this mean mitigation or did it mean uh, adaptation? It was unclear. It was climate smart. These were to be pilot projects. And if they passed peer review, farmers that use these techniques might be designated climate smart farmers and they might be able to sell their produce uh, into the market at a premium. Uh, but then the Inflation Reduction Act came later in 2022 and it allocated $20 billion over five years, $20 billion additional over five years to traditional Department of Agriculture conservation programs. These programs have climate benefits. It's just things uh, like uh, taking uh, cropland out of production for 10 years to uh, restore the soil or or measures to, uh, to reduce uh, uh, pollution. Uh, air quality incentive programs, uh, but uh, uh, nothing absolutely specific, no mention of carbon banks, no mention of regenerative agriculture. In fact, Secretary Vilsack to the present day doesn't use the term regenerative agriculture at a time when uh, it's, uh, it's trending everywhere else. It's interesting, the Biden administration is not against the term. Uh, John Kerry, who is the president's uh, climate uh, ambassador uses the term, but uh, the specialists inside USDA uh, do not. Now, you, you can probably tell from my tone of voice that uh, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not terribly bothered by the fact that uh, regenerative agriculture hasn't yet been fully embraced by the Biden administration's Department of Agriculture. It's it's a term that's not well enough defined and one that might be a little bit too vulnerable to false claims and greenwashing to to merit large expenditures of of, of government funding uh, my my preferred approach is uh, precision agriculture uh, and this is also something relatively new it's it's uh, taken over a large part of 
was so-called industrial farming since about 1980. The, the precision agriculture uses modern information intensive technologies um, to reduce the resource use of farms for every added bushel of production. This includes uh, sensors and remote sensing, uh, high precision GPS satellite based systems, integrated electronic communications, um, uh, soil mapping, in, digital soil mapping, so that the equipment in the field that knows exactly where it is to less than an inch accuracy with GPS systems will know exactly what kind of soil is underneath this equipment. And if it then can apply inputs in a computer managed variable rate manner, um, it's gonna be able to optimize the use of, of, of inputs like, like water, like fertilizer, like lime, uh, and there'll be almost zero waste and much less runoff and, uh, the farmer will save money because uh, he's not over applying fertilizer and the environment will be protected because uh, there'll be less runoff. Precision agriculture has been delivering uh, significant environmental protection now for, for more than 20 years. These are data from the Department of Agriculture on declines in land use, soil erosion, irrigation, water, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions per unit of output, per bushel of production between 1980 and 2011 for six different uh, important field crops. You'll see that uh, per bushel of production, land use is way down by sometimes 30% or more soil erosion, uh, way down. Uh, irrigation water applied uh, is, uh, is down. Energy use uh, is down, in some case way down for soybeans. And as a result, greenhouse gas emissions are also down by a third or more for some of these crops. So we're already getting uh, payoffs here from uh, precision agriculture in, in reduced resource use and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Now there aren't any uh, numbers for chemical use on this chart, but chemical use is also down uh, since the onset of the precision agriculture uh, era. If you look at fertilizer use, it's, been essentially flat in the United States since 1980, even though agricultural production has increased by 46%. So per bushel of production, fertilizer use is way down. Pesticide use in absolute terms is down by 18% since 1980. And insecticide use specifically uh, has declined in US agriculture since 1972. It's declined by 82%. So we're cutting way back on uh, chemical use as well as land, uh, irrigation, water, and energy use. Here's the story for American agriculture overall. Uh, the, the line at the top is total agricultural output. This is an index of agricultural output set at one in 1948. Uh, you can see that since 1948, total agricultural output by value has uh, increased um, more than two and a half times, it's nearly tripled. But total farm inputs, uh, that's the, the blue line at the bottom, haven't really increased at all. So we're getting three times as much for the same value of inputs. Uh, and that reflects the fact that we're using much less uh, water, land, fuel, uh, and, and energy per, uh, per unit of, of output. Uh, Here's the story for corn specifically. This is dramatic. Uh, the red line is corn acreage going all the way back to 1870 in the United States. The blue line is total corn production. You can see that since about 1940, corn production has essentially been decoupled from, from land use. Today, we're, we're producing five times as much corn as we did in 1940 on 20% less land. Um, this is uh, uh, a science-driven, technology-driven uh, increase in, in land productivity that, uh, that looks uh, sustainable to me. So we're do I think we're doing pretty well at the agricultural end, uh, but 
at the food consumption end, and this is the part of my talk that uh, uh, where I'm going to show my my pessimism, our dietary health problems uh, are are worsening, uh, and uh, of course this is probably something that that uh, this audience already knows uh, more than I do about. Uh, only one in Americans, one in ten Americans, is consuming the recommended minimum daily servings of of fruit and vegetables today, only one in 10. Uh, instead, we overconsume ultra processed foods that have added sugar, salt, and fat. And as a result now, 42% of American adults are clinically obese, uh, which is triple uh, the level of the 1960s. And obesity now contributes to 300,000 deaths every year from diabetes, heart attack, stroke, uh, cancer. This is a this is a dietary calamity in the United States, and we're not going to fix this by changing uh, the way we farm. Here's here's the adult obesity trend. Uh, you can see it's gone since 1999 from 30 percent to 42 percent obesity prevalence. These are numbers from the CDC. They do not include the results of uh, of the pandemic, um, but um, uh, the CDC hasn't produced numbers for the pandemic years yet, but the U.S. Department of Agriculture Economic Research Service, using a, a representative uh, survey, uh, calculated that obesity prevalence during the pandemic, the first year of the pandemic, increased by an additional 3%. So uh, we're, we're in serious trouble. Uh, we're, we're hitting the red line when it comes to obesity prevalence in the United States. It's not, as, as I say, we're not going to we're not going to change this by uh, by embracing uh, regenerative agriculture. Uh, even if we go to organic, it's going to actually it's going to actually worsen our dietary health because organic uh, produce costs on average fifty four percent more than conventional produce. So if we went to an organic food system, fresh fruits and vegetables would cost 50% more and the consumption of these healthy foods would uh, decline. And scientists have not found any offsetting benefit in terms of the nutrient content of organic foods. The, uh, the organic industry claims that organic foods are more uh, nutritious, uh, but um, studies at Stanford U University and elsewhere have shown uh, that uh, there's essentially no difference uh, in nutrient content between organic and conventional uh, foods. Now, the organic industry says, well, um, no, 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 look, uh, organic milk has 50% more beta carotene than, than conventional milk. And that's actually true, but it's misleading because conventional milk has practically no beta carotene at all. So 50% more than almost nothing at all is still almost nothing at all. So we don't get a, nu a nutrient benefit from organic, uh, but we'd get uh, we'd get higher prices that would discourage consumption. If we relocalized our food system, uh, something similar would happen. The price of healthy foods would go up. Uh, currently, the United States imports one half of its fresh fruit, much of that, of course, uh, off season from the Southern Hemisphere or Central America. If we relocalized our system and terminated those imports, the price of fresh fruit would go up and consumption would go down. We import one third of our fresh vegetables. So the same would happen uh, there. Consumption of fruits and vegetables would decline if we relocalized. And it's often forgotten that 80% of the seafood that we consume, another healthy choice is uh, imported. So uh, our, our nutrient benefits from seafood would decline as well. Well, what if we ended farm subsidies? That's sometimes, uh, suggested that well, we have a bad diet because we subsidize corn and soybean farmers. Well, um, actually, we do have farm subsidies. I'm, I'm generally opposed to them because they increase the income of farmers that uh, have, on average, incomes that are 25 or 26 percent higher than the incomes of the Americans who are paying the taxes to, to pay for the subsidies. But uh, Farm subsidies don't promote uh, cheap food. 
they actually are intended to in, increase the income of farmers by making the price of the commodity sold by farmers higher rather than lower. Uh, so we do that for sugar by putting restrictions on sugar imports. The cost of sugar because of farm subsidies is 60% is higher in the United States than it would be otherwise. We do that for wheat by uh, taking wheat acreage out of, out of production, paying farmers to, uh, to take their acres out of production for 10 years at a time. We do it for corn by mandating the use of about one third of our corn crop for use as uh, auto fuel, uh, ethanol. By taking that corn out of the food supply, we raise the price of the corn that's left for animal feed. And, and corn and soybean prices go together. So corn and soybeans and wheat and sugar are all artificially expensive because of farm subsidies rather than artificially cheap. And if we remove those subsidies, these um, obesity inducing crops would become even cheaper and our dietary health problems would worsen. Unhealthy eating in America isn't caused by, by food deserts uh, either. This is another popular uh, belief that uh, that is promoted uh, by, among others, uh, the food industry that would like uh, more people buying uh, food products in supermarkets. But um, a 2011 study in the Archives of Internal Medicine found after 15 years of data surveyed for 5,000 people in five cities, no connection at all between grocery store access and and healthy diets. And other studies have found uh, the same thing. Uh, as obesity has worsened in the United States, access to nutritious foods has not declined. It's gone up. It's gone up significantly. Between 1970 and 2014, the availability of fresh fruit per capita in the United States marketplace increased by 40%. Fresh vegetable availability up by 21%. Fresh broccoli availability per capita increased 13-fold. And these are numbers adjusted for spoilage, plate waste, and other losses. Uh, the problem isn't that nutritious foods have become less available. It's that unhealthy foods have become much more available. They now surround us in what are called food swamps, not uh, food deserts. These are foods made by food manu manufacturing companies that design them intentionally to be uh, as, as addictive as possible. They add uh, sugar. The foods are ultra processed, which, uh, which produces an interesting effect. Uh, ultra processed foods are consumed much more quickly than minimally processed foods. A famous study two or three years ago found that if you give two groups of individuals exactly the same foods, tell them they can eat any quantity they want, but one group gets those foods in a ultra processed form and the other gets them in a minimally processed form. Those that get them in an ultra processed form will consume an average of 500 calories a day more. So this is a, these are dangerous food products. Uh, uh, these, these food products are formulated carefully to hit a bliss point uh, in, in our mouth. They trigger the reward circuit on our brain and, and we, we crave them again. Uh, before we before we need it before we need to eat again, and then of course the food companies advertise them heavily, including to uh, uh, to children. These I think are the sources of the major sources of our dietary health crisis. And supermarkets are not the solution. Supermarkets are part of the problem. They're a part of the swamp. The 2018 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation study found that only 30% of food company product offerings are healthy. 70% are unhealthy. And nine out of 10 packaged food products in supermarkets are ultra processed. And added sugars are found in nearly 70% of packaged foods today, including, including health foods. So what are my policy solutions? I think we need to take steps not to change the way we farm, but to discipline the food companies that are filling our marketplace with so many uh, dangerous uh, concoctions. Uh, I think we need to restrict food ads to children. It's hard to do in the United States because the Supreme Court has decided that advertising is commercial speech and deserves protection under the First Amendment. Uh, only the United States Supreme Court could come up with something like that. Uh, we should have mandatory front of package nutrition labeling 
right now. We have mandatory side of package uh, nutrition labeling, but it's just a nutrition facts panel full of uh, fine print and small numbers. We need front of package symbols that can be scanned by shoppers at a glance to give them uh, 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 like a stoplight system, uh, green light, yellow light, red light, to tell them at a glance whether the product meets minimum standards of, of nutrition. And we need excise taxes on sugar sweetened beverages at the state or federal level. Uh, four or five cities have done this at the municipal level, and it's cut back uh, on the consumption of these beverages significantly. We need to do that at the national level. Now, these, these are not new ideas. If you look at Europe, most countries in, on the continent of Europe have uh, one or two or all three of these policies in place, and they have uh, obesity prevalence that's only about half as high as in the United States. In the United States, at the federal level, we don't have any of these uh, policies in place. So uh, my my agenda would be to uh, to work hard uh, to move forward in in these areas. Of course, uh, the United States has a very different political culture from the continent of Europe. Uh, we celebrate uh, personal freedom and personal responsibility, and uh, we we don't uh, embrace social responsibility. We embrace personal responsibility even if that so often leads um, under, the, uh, <laughs> under the schemes of food companies to personal irresponsibility in the category of healthy eating. So let me stop there. If you want more of my thinking on these subjects, uh, uh, this is the 2021 book from, uh, from Knopf that was mentioned in the introduction, Resetting the Table, Straight Talk About the Food We Grow and Eat. So I will stop there and I will stop sharing my screen and welcome any comments or questions. Thank you, Dr. Prahlberg. That was incredibly eye-opening. I actually was not surprised by the pessimistic portion, but I actually was quite surprised by the uh, optimistic portion of your talk. Um, I, I already see there's a question, but I wanted to start with one. Um, so I was really um, struck by the, the high output uh, graph with the stable input. And I noticed that ended in 2019. And we actually have been see, seeing extreme weather frequency even beyond the last uh, three years. But I'm thinking about all the droughts, the floods, the fires. And I'm wondering if you still are optimistic about that output input. Um, what is our trajectory? Will this, um, will this precision agriculture be enough to continue that in the face of changing climate? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And in the United States, um, because of the very large investments that have been made in agricultural science, including um, improved uh, genetics for crops and animals, including uh, the precision agriculture methods that I mentioned that allow you to grow more with uh, with less water. If you use drip irrigation, you don't need a lot of water. <laughs> if you uh, if you have um, um, strip tillage and no-till machinery, you don't have to expose your soil to a lot of erosion. Uh, the United States is pretty well positioned through its investments in science to stay ahead of the climate penalties that its farmers are already uh, paying. I mean, U.S. output continues to go up. It would have gone up even more if it had not encountered some of the, the climate pressures that, that you mentioned. And, and it's, um, it's regional in the United States. Um, some parts of the United States, uh, the North, for example, the, the Northern upper Midwest um, could see more rainfall and will have a longer growing season thanks to climate change and its crop productivity could uh, increase even as farmers in the drier parts of the Southwest experience uh, uh, severe difficulties. So it is complicated. What I worry about are farmers in Africa and South Asia where they, they use uh, more traditional technologies. They don't have as much good agricultural science uh, coming out of the pipeline. They don't have 
uh, as much efficient uh, irrigation. Uh, they grow crops like wheat that in some cases are already uh, producing uh, at the upper range of the temperatures that they will tolerate. Uh, these are countries that, uh, that stand to be uh, damaged uh, uh, considerably by the, the looming intensification of, of climate. And we've seen that, uh, we've seen that recently, uh, we're seeing it right now in the Horn of Africa. We've seen it recently in, well, in Pakistan, where uh, a massive flood inundated about a third of the country because their infrastructure system uh, wasn't well enough engineered uh, to contain uh, to, to contain the, the volume of water that came down the rivers. It's um, it's the it's the low capacity countries that will find it most difficult to to adapt to the climate threats to the agricultural sector that are coming along. Yes, very true. Um, there's a few questions uh, that I'd like to um, ask now. One is, do you believe there is a connection between the nutritional value of the crops grown on the farm versus the food which is produced by industry? Uh, okay, say so say that again. So I guess the question is more like the the, the food that's um, in a industrialized big big ag, for example. Uh, versus the the food that comes from the farm, the local farm, is there yeah. a difference in terms of the nutritional value? I think you you alluded to a little bit in your in your in your yeah talk. Yeah, yeah well uh, of course uh, the food companies that manufacture these ultra processed products with too much added sugar, salt, and fat use farm commodities as one of uh, the ingredients. They also throw in a lot of things like. Uh, artificial coloring and emulsifiers and and who knows what else uh, they're edible but they're not nutritious uh, they're but the, they have a commodity basis sometime part of the a basis uh, the 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 crops that come from farms are generally nutritious although in some cases a little bit less nutritious than in the past because uh, they've been, developed by crop scientists for, for yield, for shelf life, uh, for um, uh, resistance to, to drought and to pests. Uh, uh, crop breeders uh, haven't spent as much time uh, on developing crops for, for flavor or for nutrition. Uh, of course, uh, um, and in some cases, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually has done a study of this and has found that in a few cases, the, the produce grown on commercial farms today is less nutritious uh, per pound than in the past. But uh, it's also more widely available than in the past and less expensive than in the past, especially in, in the winter months. So the net impact on nutrition is probably less negative than, than, the, than the loss that you suffer from having uh, one of today's radishes compared to a radish from 50 years ago. Thank you. And another one of our audience members would like your thoughts about GMO crops and their impacts on health. And I would just add to that in conjunction with that, the use the GMOs were really often used so that there's some, um, they're resistant to um, um, pesticides, for example. And so I guess then there's the, also the question about using these, you um, had alluded to in your talk that the nutritional value doesn't change, but we, I'm wondering about the chemicals and especially now as we're finding more forever chemicals in the soil and the water. So I guess it's a loaded question, but your thoughts about GMO and other things that are um, yeah. in Okay. Products well, uh, uh, the the nutritional value of conventional versus organic. Um, scientists haven't found a difference there, uh, but some some GMOs um, are uh, different from conventional. Uh, 
but uh, they're, they're mostly different in their agronomic properties, their ability to um, self-protect against insect damage. So-called BT crops that are GMOs can self-protect against lepidopteran insects without any insecticide sprays. So that's one reason insecticide use is way down in the United States. Uh, as for consumer food safety, here, uh, governments make decisions uh, case by case. And so far, there hasn't been any GMO crop on the market that has been found to be uh, less uh, safe than convention than the counterpart conventional crop. And that's um, that's the opinion. That's the official opinion of science academies, not just uh, in the United States, but uh, in Europe as well. GMOs are highly unpopular in Europe and seldom found in the marketplace in Europe because European governments have placed them under such tight restriction. But if you ask um, uh, the French Academy of Science, uh, and the French Academy of Medicine, the Royal Society in London, the German Academy of of uh, humanities and science, uh, and even uh, the European Commission, uh, they have all said in writing that they have not found any new risks to human health or to the environment from any of the GMOs that have been put, up, been put on the market so far. Now, I don't think GMOs are gonna come back and uh, I don't think people are gonna change their mind about GMOs and start going looking for them in the marketplace. Uh, I'm afraid they've been stigmatized, uh, uh, durably stigmatized. What I'm interested in is the next generation of biotechnology, which is genome edited crops uh, that are developed using uh, methods like CRISPR that uh, change the, the genetics of a crop, but without bringing in DNA from an unrelated species. These are not transgenic crops. These are, uh, these are crops where genetic traits in the conventional variety have either been deleted or they've been expressed, uh, they've been upgraded to be, give a higher expression. And uh, this is a technique that was developed in 2015 and it's now uh, coming into use. We have one or two gene edited crops uh, already in the commercial marketplace. Uh, and so far, most countries around the world have uh, decided that uh, these do not have to be considered GMOs. They don't have to be regulated as tightly as transgenic crops. Uh, the European Union hesitated on that. The European Court of Justice said, no, 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 we have to, uh, we have to regulate these just like GMOs. And that would have driven them out of the marketplace just like GMOs in Europe. But the European Union just last summer uh, is, has reconsidered. They've seen so many other countries around the world, including uh, fastidious countries like Japan, including China, including India, including countries in Africa going ahead with genome editing and they don't wanna be left be behind. And so the European Union uh, Commission has now proposed a relaxation in the uh, in the regulations of genome edited crops, and I think they they will go forward, and they'll be tested for safety, uh, uh, or reviewed for safety on a case by case basis. And any company that puts one of these crops on the market, uh, and and if something bad happens, that company will be legally liable. And I think that that's enough of a of a threat uh, to deter uh, an irresponsible use of the technology. Right. There's a, there are a lot of questions. I think we'll have to just pick one or two more. Um, question about precision agriculture. Is it affordable um, and can it be used even, you mentioned the West of Africa and Asia, is it accessible? And also how does it change soil health? Yeah, um, uh, it, um, it protects soil health. Um, because uh, it, it makes, uh, if, if you have equipment that allows you to, to strip till and lay down a row of seeds and lay down a dripped uh, uh, fertilizer right on that row of seeds while leaving the rest of the field under turf, uh, that's a good way to 
reduce diesel fuel costs. It's a good way to reduce your your fertilizer costs, but it's also a good way to protect the soil. So uh, precision agricultural techniques aren't, um, you know, they, they're not motivated by uh, protecting soil health, but they revolve around deep knowledge of soil characteristics, including uh, uh, acidity, including chemical composition, uh, square meter by square meter in the field. That's what a digital soil map is. And the equipment moving across the field uh, adjusts its treatments of the soil and the inputs it lays down square meter by square meter because it's precision guided by satellites. Uh, the, uh, the I think uh, the first the first part of the question is, is more challenging to me. Uh, uh, precision agriculture right now is only affordable to a large highly capitalized, highly specialized farms. So here we have um, a conundrum. Uh, the, the, the methods that use the fewest resources per bushel of production and produce the least runoff and the least waste are most available uh, to large, uh, highly capitalized farms that uh, that are run by people who have uh, enormous personal wealth. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, and you can slowly move some of the make slowly make some of these uh, precision uh, agriculture techniques available to smaller and mid-sized farms by by selling them as services rather than asking the farmer to buy the equipment. But um, farmers in in developing countries. Uh, are gonna to have to pursue a different kind of precision agriculture. They're gonna to have to have things like handheld nitrogen sensors that, uh, that can tell them whether the crops are getting enough nitrogen or not. And then they can use hand applications if necessary to put the nitrogen down. Uh, small farmers don't really need GPS systems uh, because they're on small farms. They know every inch of the farm intimately. They work them by hand. They do need better soil tests and they do need better nitrogen tests. And they could use a better subsoil moisture tests. But these are being developed by agricultural engineers on a, a small scale that should be available to, to small farmers. Some small farmers are pursuing precision agriculture today by once again renting services uh, they will they will rent the services of a, of a private company that will use lasers to to level their small field a level in a level field there's no water runoff there's no chemical runoff every drop of irrigation goes straight down into the roots of the crop that is precision agriculture and it's being made available to small farmers who can afford the the rental fee uh, but it's going to be a struggle uh, for small farmers to to do as well as large farmers when it comes to using drones artificial intelligence machine learning uh, uh, satellite uh, precision uh, and uh, and soil mapping well, I think we're at the top of the hour and I really appreciate your time your expertise and um, your sound policies that you are advocating for. Uh, thank you again for joining us. And um, but just before we leave, I just, um, Lisa, if you don't mind putting up the last slide to announce our upcoming webinars. The next month in October, we're going to continue on this theme of food is medicine. And we'll have a panel, which uh, includes a conversation with Healthcare Without Harm and their Cool Pledge initiative, along with a community kitchen and a local farm and how we're bringing, bringing that food to hospitals as well as universities and other communities. Sorry, I don't have a slide for that. In November, we will have Dr. Rose Goldman who will be talking about what, um, what clinicians need to be thinking about in terms of occupational health when it comes to the climate crisis. So thank you everybody. And thank you, Dr. Pollard. Thank you again.